now that we've talked about something that has been talked about quite a bit already and, and mm -hmm. gotten your uh, reaction to it, there's another um, aspect of your tenure that I think is really important um, that didn't get talked about much. And that was your work advocating for people mm -hmm. who sleep outside in Waltham. So I honestly don't remember how that's something that I got pulled into originally, except to say that there's a lot of credit that goes to Chris Gamble for that. Um, people who follow 781 so far know who he is and might be familiar with some of the work that he's done. But um, when there were issues with the way the community was treating people who were unhoused, he would bring them to me and I would go to other counselors to try to work on that. And that was just because of the friendship that he and I had. I found it very easy to see the way that unhoused people just were really falling through the cracks in our society, that it's not anyone's fault that they don't have housing. And all of the issues that contribute to homelessness are, they're not an individual responsibility. Um, they are failures of our society to protect people, to get people help, uh, to make housing affordable. And it's so easy to see the way people just fall through the cracks. Um, and it, I, I hope that it's easy for people to empathize with that. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like it isn't always, but it, it ought to be. They're, we're all human beings just doing our best and we need to treat each other decently. What are the kinds of issues that people ran into that then could be solved by talking to somebody in government? Um, so things that we worked on, um, the warming centers in Waltham, we, the city provides places for people in, in the depth of winter to go to sleep who might otherwise be sleeping outside. And um, that was something where we helped put pressure on the mayor to open those spaces earlier or to help improve the conditions. Um, we never ever got to a place where I was totally satisfied with it, unfortunately. Um, but I like to think that we move the needle a little. Um, when COVID hit, there was also a lot of organizing that went into making sure that there was bathroom access for people who were unhoused. Um, that was more of a mass mobilization that Chaplains on the Way really helped lead. Um, and they do great work uh, promoting self-advocacy among the unhoused population. Um, and they helped organize a lot of community members to do a calling campaign to the mayor's office and an emailing campaign to get the money allocated and get the service put up to have bathroom access when the library was closed down and everything was not accessible to people. When you had to talk to other counselors about this, did you get the sense that they felt like helping homeless people was part of their job or did they see it as something outside their job? I never went to anyone's who saw it as outside of their job. <laughs> um, but there are I, some who perceived. Yes, uh, yes. yes. Okay. Um, there's an interesting division in the way Waltham City Councilors think about their constituents sometimes. This is not universally true, but there's, there's almost like a class system where there's like, there's homeowners and there's taxpayers and then there's residents. And you even hear it the way some counselors would talk about, we're going to do our best for the taxpayers of Waltham, or we're going to do our best for the citizens of Waltham. But this community is made up of everyone who's here, whether or not they own a home, whether or not they pay taxes, whether or not they're a citizen of the United States. If you are in Waltham, you're part of our community and you deserve to be treated the same as anybody else. Um, so when I had these issues come up, I, I leaned on the mentors that I had in city council and I leaned on people who I knew cared about those issues so that we could all put our weight pulling in the same direction, putting pressure on the mayor's office. Um, I got an email once from her that said, I help those who help themselves. And it really broke my heart to see that she would think of other people that way and say that some people based on their circumstances don't deserve the kind of help that I think they do. Um, and having a mobilization of people to say, we are homeowners, we are taxpayers, we are citizens, and we want you to do this, helps put pressure on her to act in ways that I think better reflect the values of this community. What about um, 
other people who work in City Hall and work for the city government. Um, during that period, uh, when there were tents on the Waltham Common, uh, the people who lived in them must have been interacting with city employees a lot. Um, did you, do you get the sense that people who work for the city see helping those people as part of their job or do they see that as a, a liability? So I am not gonna call out any departments in a negative way, but I am gonna call out some that are really great. Um, the housing department does a lot of work to help people access housing uh, and to place people in housing and to make sure that there's stability for those people. Um, the health department has a lot of really great programs. Um, prior to the pandemic, they were doing, I think on a monthly basis, resource meetings for people with substance use disorders. Um, and that was a huge effort that they were putting in to help make resources available, um, but without forcing it on anybody, making it a, a come as you are sort of environment where people could just come in and ask when they were ready to get assistance. Um, Michelle Feely has done a fantastic job uh, with that. And our health department, I think they work their butt off <laughs> and they don't get a lot of recognition. All their departments seemed a little bit less invested. And I think it does come down to a pretty big extent to the department leadership. Um, and I do want to note from a political side that the mayor appoints our department heads in Waltham, but the city council votes to confirm them. So this is something that if your audience sees that departments maybe aren't living up to the values of the community, you can definitely talk to your counselors about that when reappointment time comes up. So homelessness is a, a visible side effect of how high housing costs, but it's also an issue that affects not just low-income people, but middle-income people too, yeah. in a lot of different ways. If you had, um, you know, your ideal city council where everybody was on the same page on this issue, what, what, would, what, would, what would be the best way forward with housing that would both help the people who need it the most, but also sort of help everybody? Do you, does that make sense? Is there a way yeah. to do that? Oh gosh. So I guess what I'm really asking is, do we need to create more housing and what kind of housing would it be? We do need to create more housing and we need to create all kinds of housing. And if I could wave a magic wand and make two changes, uh, one of them would be the kind of upzoning that is happening in Minneapolis. And I think other communities are talking about where they have eliminated single family zoning. You can build two family or bigger depending on the exact zoning, but you can build at least a two family by right anywhere in Minneapolis. That's not to say building a single family is forbidden, but any new construction has the option to be two family if it fits the lot, if it fits the development, if it fits the economics of the place. Um, and we see in other communities in Massachusetts like Cambridge and Somerville, how common building two and three family buildings is. Um, and that obviously doesn't solve it, but it creates more units at a higher density than we have in Waltham. Um, the other thing that I'm really interested in is our neighbor Newton did a few years ago, which is accessory dwelling units. Um, and that takes something like an in-law apartment, provided it meets code standards and is safe, um, makes it available for the homeowner to rent out. And what that does is um, provides an income stream for the homeowner. So maybe they can buy something a little bit bigger, but it also creates more units of housing. And it, the way Waltham went or Newton went about it, they really went out and built a consensus around this and showed the way that it's a win-win for everybody. Um, it can help with people aging in place. Um, creating those units can help create like intergenerational housing in some circumstances. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that come along with it. And I would like to see Waltham explore that. And I think, hopefully, I'd love to see it enacted, but I think we definitely need to start talking about it. Well, the good news is that's similar to what Colleen was saying about housing in her interview. So she can, we have at least one person carrying forward that <laughs> vision. So that's good news. Yes. So uh, I had another question. This kind of touches on thing, some things we already discussed when we were talking about police. Um, during your tenure, you introduced Waltham's first pride resolution. Thank you. And you also inter introduced the Black Lives Matter resolution and a Stop Asian Hate resolution. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to some people in town who say, I care about those issues but I'm not, I'm not comfortable with those kind of resolutions because what they say is those are national issues. And when you make a resolution about it specific to Waltham, you're implying that's a problem here. 
And people, a lot of people think, well, if you want to show that, if you want to make Waltham a welcoming place, you have to highlight the positive. You have to show how minorities are, are succeeding here. Mm -hmm. um, and not, whereas a resolution focuses on the negative. So what are your thoughts on that? So I know I said previously in this interview that not speaking about a problem doesn't make it go away. And that Waltham is not exempt from the issues that we see nationwide. Um, but I actually spent some time thinking about this and I want to share something from my life that I haven't talked about very publicly before. Um, so a lot of folks probably know from the Pride Month resolution that I identify as bisexual and queer, I use both words to describe myself depending on the circumstance. Um, but what I haven't talked about is that I was raised in a United Methodist congregation in my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. And I didn't come out to myself until my freshman year of college because my faith community was not welcoming to LGBT folks. And after I came out, I got involved in a group on campus that what we did is we would tell our own coming out stories to uh, other residential, residential communities on campus and answer questions about LGBT issues and try to bring the other students along. And as a result of that work, I ended up being invited to go to the United Methodist congregation in my college town. At that point, they were working on becoming what's called a reconciling congregation within the United Methodist faith, which means that they make a commitment to inclusivity and to social justice. And when that movement originated, it was really heavily focused on LGBT rights. Um, so I went to that faith community and participated in this and talked about how at that time, what I believed about the love that spiritual communities are called to have for each other and the love that we are taught that God has for us, um, that we can't exempt people from that if we truly believe in that in our faith. Um, since then, I have become an atheist and my faith practice, my spiritual practice is very, very different than it was at that time. But participating in that reconciling process marks congregations as being a welcoming space. And actually to prepare for this interview, I went back and looked and the congregation that I grew up in on their webpage, they say we welcome people of all gender identity and sexual orientation, but they're not a reconciling congregation. And even now with a faith that I don't participate or believe in anymore, knowing that that community I came up with still does not embrace this label was hurtful to me. It was painful to see that this community that I was a part of isn't willing to lean into acceptance and openness and inclusivity. And I think that's what I was trying to do with those Waltham resolutions was to say, we are not passively a welcoming space. We are actively a welcoming space. We recognize the way that our community, like any community, might be exclusionary or is exclusionary, is not living up to what we say we want to do to other people. And I think leaning into saying, you are welcome here, you're valued here, we see you, and we want you to be part of this community is enormously important. And that I hope anybody who watches this interview can think of a time when they felt excluded and how that felt to them. And then think of a time when somebody said, I see you for who you are and I want you to be part of my community and how big of a transition that can be for an individual. And that's why I brought forward those resolutions. And that's what I think is really important about the symbolic work that the city council is doing above the policy work that we do every day. The symbolic things really do matter. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like what you're saying is that acceptance has to be explicit or it's not yes. really explicit. <laughs> Yes. And that matches up, uh, not to get too personal. In my experience as a gay man out for 20 years, that's absolutely true. 
yeah. if you're if people don't explicitly accept you then they don't really accept you and so uh it's it's great that you were also able to apply the same principle to, to people of other races who are dealing with similar issues i am not as connected to those communities as i should be and as i would like to be and the the what i have heard is that people do appreciate that um but that we do need more diverse representation on the city council. We need city councilors who reflect all of the people of Waltham, not just Caucasian people like me. That's great. And that actually leads into my next question was there is a lot of people in town who feel like you do that. We need more diversity on the council um, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of age, in terms mm -hmm. of where you fall on the political spectrum. It doesn't quite represent the full breadth of Waltham. But the hard part is when you try to encourage diverse people to run for office, it's hard because as you have explained in this interview, it can be a really difficult job. Um, also for, for people who don't know, it, it is a paid job, but it's paid kind of as a part-time job. You can't do it as your full-time. When you try to encourage someone to run, you don't really know if it's realistic for them and you don't really know if it's gonna be a positive experience for them. So that's what I'd love to ask you who's had this experience now, <laughs> the ups and downs of it, what can Waltham do? What can we as a community do to make it a place where it's easier and more welcoming for diverse people to run for office. So there's two parts to that. And the first thing is what the community can and should be doing. And that's providing active support, not only for candidates, for, but for people who are on the city council. Um, right now is a great time to reach out to and get to know Colleen Bradley MacArthur and Paul Cates a little better as their new counselors adjusting to the role and just say like, hey, I support you, or I'm interested in learning more about you. Um, I'm glad that you're on the council. Here's the topics that are interested to me and start to build relationships with people. Um, do that with your ward counselor, do that with the at-large counselors. Um, and make sure that as we get new people elected, you continue to do that because having a broad support network and knowing people have your back is really important. Um, if I got one good job, you're doing a good job email for like every 10, you're terrible and I'm mad emails. Like that was enough to keep me going for a, a month at a time. Um, so that kind of thing is really important after people are elected. Um, the same thing goes for the campaign trail, volunteer for campaigns, turn out to vote, support candidates um, with your time, not just your money. Um, it makes a huge difference. And then to go to the money part of city council, um, that's a huge, huge, huge barrier. And it's something that I will talk at length about because it's also a problem in state legislatures in Massachusetts and across the country that in Waltham, city councilors get paid about $20,000 a year. There's a little bit of a bonus stipend for the president of the council. Um, which is a nice to have, but doesn't make a huge difference. Cambridge and Boston city councilors are both full-time and are paid a full-time salary. But the majority of other elected positions, at least inside 128, are not paid as well as Waltham city councilors. Newton makes a few thousand dollars a year, Burlington a few thousand dollars a year, Watertown even less. Um, so these elected positions are only accessible to people who either have a stable income stream from a job that allows them the time to serve on city council or people who are either retired or have a trust fund or something. Um, I was lucky that my job has flexible working hours um, so that I had time to put into city council and I could run around to meetings and make up the hours in the evenings on, on the weekends when I need to. Um, somebody working shift work doesn't have that flexibility. Um, Somebody with little kids may or may not have that flexibility depending on their family situation. Uh, somebody who's retired, it's a lot easier for them because presumably they've set themselves up to support themselves in retirement and now they can just do this as a little fun retirement hobby as some counselors have said. The changes that we would need to see in Waltham, I believe are to make the city council a full-time position. Um, the sticking point is that I don't think there's enough full-time work for 15 city councilors. I think there's probably enough full-time work for about nine of us. 
But that would be a huge, huge cultural change on the city council. Um, it would take charter reform to get there, which is an enormously difficult project. So in the short term, it would be really great if we could raise the salary for city councilors, maybe double it to 40, make it something that could be livable. That's not necessarily going to support somebody who has a mortgage and three kids, um, but it's something that would make it a lot easier for people of different backgrounds to get into that position and to live off of that wage in this community and not to have to spread themselves so thin that they're not able to contribute to city council the way we want people to be able to do. Well, if you're talking about raising it by $20,000 a year times 15 counselors, plus there's payroll mm -hmm. taxes and stuff, if that's still not a huge amount of money in, in, the, in the scope of the city budget to vastly increase the scope of people who could be elected officials. Yes. So it actually, it seems like a good sell, but as he said, it would take cultural change. And, and you mentioned it would take charter change. And this kind of makes me want, wonder, this well, is kind of speculation, but do you think- clear. Um, raising the compensation for the city council would be an ordinance amendment. Okay. Um, we have compensation ordinances. So that would be only nine members of the city council to adjust that compensation ordinance. So that is doable. Reducing the number of councilors is the charter change part of it. This has been a great conversation and especially your story about your experience um, with your faith community and and the f how the uh, you know how deep that feeling of of being welcome or unwelcome goes mm -hmm. um, i really appreciate that you have any final thoughts for us huh. stay involved in wealthy and politics it's not just about election years um it it really is about having a political culture year round uh day in day out and that that matters. Things go on in the city council that nobody ever talks about. And that's something I'm really excited about with the 781 project that um, you're involved with is making this more of a conversation, making our participatory democracy really participatory. That, that matters as a cultural change. And this is a great starting point. So thank you for the interview and thank you for the work that you're doing in our community. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you've done. Thank you for your courage in talking about things publicly that people don't talk about publicly. And uh, I can't wait to see what you do next, but I hope it allows you to come be a guest on our city council recap show quite often. I'm very seriously not making any recurring commitments right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, That's why you're a special no, guest. No commitments. Yeah, exactly. But, um, exactly. I hope we have another chance <laughs> to see you soon. All right. Thanks, Josh.